Hi, I'm Sam Bowman. I'm Deputy Director of the Adam Smith Institute, which is a free market think tank in London. Uh, one of the, mo the most important issues that I like to focus on is immigration. And in today's talk, what I want to do is give you a rough outline of the co uh, costs and benefits that economists generally think are associated with immigration. So um, everybody knows that immigration is a very important issue in politics at the moment. It dominates the news headlines, it's especially in the UK at the moment. Um, the UK Independence Party has made it one of their main issues. The Conservative Party has str campaigned very strongly on it. In the United States, uh, the Republican Party has made it a big issue. And um, more or less everywhere in the Western world, immigration is something that people have an opinion about. But uh, it's important to be able to quantify the costs and the benefits from immigration because it may be that we have too much immigration or it may be that we have too little immigration or maybe we have the right amount of immigration, but we can't know that. We can't know whether we want more or less whether, unless we try to quantify the good things and the bad things and weigh those two things against each other. Um, and my um, worry or my kind of concern or objection at least to the uh, debate that we've got at the moment is that we never try to do that, that um, all the political debate, as with many political debates, seems to be more about people's feelings and emotions than about cold, hard facts. So what I want to do is outline a broadly positive case um, in defense of immigration, uh, but also to talk about some of the uh, problems with immigration as well. So the first thing to note is that um, we can actually do, we've actually just asked people uh, Ipsos Mori, the polling firm, has just asked people who are against immigration why they're against immigration. And the important thing to know is that most of them, um, overwhelmingly in fact, say that economic reasons are their reasons for opposing immigration. So um, for the, the, the number one, the, everybody who wants less immigration to the UK was asked to name two reasons why they want less immigration. The number one reason was that 37% um, said that they take people's jobs. Um, they drive down native wages, they take people's jobs. Number two is that um, the country's overcrowded, we can't bear more people. Uh, that's kind of a nebulous one. I don't think it's um, actually that important to go into because just in terms of um, actual space, we've built on less than 5% uh, of, the, of the UK and even less of the US, uh, but it's still worth noting. And number three is that 31% say that immigrants are a drain on the, on the welfare state and that we can't afford them, uh, the health service can't bear them and so on, the education system can't bear them, and basically they're just too expensive. Interestingly, it's only when you get down to 4%, um, way, way down the list of concerns that people name, when you get to a social or a cultural objection. So only 4% of people, and bearing in mind everybody was allowed to name two problems, mention integration and um, crime, uh, or, or crime as one of their objections to immigration. And that's very interesting, because when you're within the kind of political bubble, um, and you talk about immigration, usually people who are against immigration will just say, oh yeah, yeah forget about the economics of it. Um, most people really care about integration. But in fact, when you ask them, that's not the case. And my uh, suggestion is that if more people realized, um, or if more people understood the basic facts and the basic economics of immigration, then they might have a very different opinion about immigration. So, in almost all political questions, we're very ignorant. Um, political ignorance is very, very much pervasive. It's not just on this question, it's on many. Um, in the UK, uh, we've asked people, which do you think is a bigger expense for the government? Job seekers allowance, which is what we pay to people when they're out of work and looking, unemployment benefit in other words, or pensions? And almost everybody thinks that we spend much more on job seekers allowance than on pensions. Uh, in the US and in the UK, when you ask people to name uh, the biggest ticket items in budget in government spending, in fact, pensions almost never come up there. Uh, foreign aid is the thing that usually tops the list, probably because people don't really like foreign aid, maybe because it's in the news quite a lot. But in fact, foreign aid constitutes an absolutely tiny uh, fraction of government spending. It's, it's irrelevant. Um, so it's not just economic theory that people aren't generally aware of. It's the basic facts that they would need to make a decision about policy. And that's important because we're not saying, oh, well, you're ignorant, so you can't make a decision. We, uh, what I'm suggesting is that if we actually asked people what are the basic facts you would need to know in order for you to make a good decision about this, as you judge a good decision, most people, I think, would tell you that one thing that would be important would be to know how many immigrants are in the country. Another thing would be to know what impact do those immigrants have on them. Um, and it seems to me that people possibly think they know these things, but in fact they don't. So my evidence for that is um, one of these public ignorance polls, and I find these things really, really interesting because um, they, they kind of show how detached people are from uh, reality when it comes to politics. So these are drawings that come from BuzzFeed, but the polling was initially done by Ipsos Mori. And um, the first question was, what percentage of the population do you think are immigrants? 
Um, and the average guess, so bearing in mind that some people will have given a really accurate guess, and I'll tell you what that is in a minute, some people will have given a completely wild 50%, 40%, something like that, but the average guess uh, in the UK was that 31% of the population are first-generation immigrants, um, one in three. That's very, very large. The reality is that 13% of the population are immigrants. Um, that's not quite uh, a third as much, but it's, it's much, much less than half as much as the average guess. Um, so 13% versus 31% is big. And I think that um, if, you were, if you spoke to any voter and you asked them, uh, in order to make a good immigration policy, should you know how many immigrants there are in the country, or should you have a rough idea of how many immigrants there are in the country, then most of them would say that you would. Secondly, when we come on to religion, um, which is of course a very important part of uh, cultural integration, uh, the average guess is that 24% of the population are Muslims in the UK. Um, and the reality is that 5% of the population are Muslims. So people wildly overestimate the number of Muslims by a factor of five. Um, how many Muslims there are in the country? What percentage of the country is, is, is Muslim? Um, and this, I think, almost certainly feeds into one of the main kind of, or, or a concern that people have about immigration in general. So not only do they not know the basic facts, and I think that those basic facts are important, but I think that that illustrates how little they would get, they grasp economics because basic facts are something that you know you can learn if you go searching around googling around if you really want to know them but the economics can be very difficult to understand so I think this might explain why in spite of what I'm about to tell you so many people disagree with um, with immigration nonetheless so the question I want to deal with first is what Im what impact do immigrants have on natives the conventional belief is that they basically drive down native wages basically you have an, in an increase in the supply of labor which they think will uh, reduce the price um, not unreasonably, I suppose, um, and that they'll take native jobs. So the first um, kind of a concept to understand when we're trying to understand what happens when um, an immigrant comes into a country and looks for work is the idea of the division of labor. So why is it that economists don't think that immigrants necessarily drive down living standards for people or necessarily take jobs? And the answer comes from Adam Smith. So Adam Smith um, wrote in 1776 in The Wealth of Nations about a pin factory where um, four men working alone could make 100 pins each. So let's say you have four different machines, one that takes a block of metal, turns it into little matchsticks, one that turns it into points, one that polishes it, and one that pushes, puts all those little pins into a box. So that man working on each machine for a quarter of the day can produce about 100 pins. But if you divide the labor, and if you put one man at each machine and have him working at that all day, and specializing in that and learning how to use it to, uh, to, the kind of, to its maximum potential, uh, that 400 pins between the four of them can turn into 10,000 pins. So you get a huge exponential increase in the number of pins that's created just by people specializing through the division of labor. This is why international trade is usually assumed to make people better off. So even though Chinese, Chinese people might be making our TVs or Indians might be doing uh, call centers and things like that, things that people in the UK or in the US might once have been doing, and we don't consider that to usually make us worse off overall because new jobs are created and that, increasing, that increase in the specialization of labor, in the division of labor, leads to more wealth being produced overall. More pins being produced, more money for everyone. There is a question about who gets that money. There is a distributional question, but I'll come on to that later on. So there is then the idea of um, the, a kind of fixed number of jobs. Um, and I think that it's, it's kind of easy to, re to understand why this is, a, this is usually called the lump of labor fallacy. When you have an immigrant coming in, why don't they just displace a worker who can then no, never find a job? Because there's no fixed share of jobs. Uh, we can always think of new things for people to do. And immigrants, as well as supplying things, also demand things. So if an immigrant gets a job in a supermarket, they use their earnings to, then, to, to buy things, to, to try and get, um, to, to, to basically create new jobs. Um, sure, it's dispersed around the economy, they're not giving all that money to a single person, but it adds up. Um, and an example of where this has, um, I mean, basically proof of this, is that when women entered the labor force in the 20th century, that was the biggest change in the constitution of the labor market we've seen, basically, since the end of serfdom. Um, that should, according to people who think that immigrants steal jobs, have led to huge male unemployment. But it didn't, because we thought of new things for the men to do, and, we thought of, uh, and the women themselves spent the money that they earned and created new jobs. So there's a really interesting study from Denmark that came out earlier this year that looked at Yugoslavian refugees, people from places like Serbia, Croatia, who went to Denmark in the 1990s and 2000s, fleeing war and so on, to start a new life. 
And that study found that those people did indeed take native jobs. There were jobs that maybe once would have gone to a Dan Danish person in a supermarket or in a field picking fruit or something like that, um, and then instead went to a Yugoslav refugee. But they also created new jobs. And what's very interesting is that the jobs that they created, the new jobs that didn't exist before these immigrants came, were more complex and more productive because this, this increased division of labor took place and more wealth was being produced overall. And those jobs, in general, went to Danish people. So Danish low-skilled workers who would have been working those very unproductive jobs in supermarkets and things like that before seem to have been pushed up into a more complex job category by this influx of immigrants. And that's a very interesting uh, case study in how this uh, division of labor can work. There's also the impact of entrepreneurs. Immigrants are twice as likely to start new businesses. In Silicon Valley, half of firms, of tech firms there, have at least one immigrant founder or co-founder. Um, and it's not, not, all, not all immigrants are going to be Sergey Brin, the founder of Google from Russia, but um, you know, they might just set up a corner shop, they might come up with a new way of cleaning windows, something very small, mundane like that. But any kind of innovation like that will increase the total uh, living standards that we have. And the data is quite clear. In the US, a one percentage point rise in the immigrant's share of the labor force leads to a 0.5% rise in native productivity, which a productivity usually leads to increase, uh, increases in wages. In the UK, we see the same effect, although it's much smaller. Um, in France, interestingly, there is a small decrease in native welfare when immigrants come in. So what's going on here? Why is it that in almost every OECD or Western European country, we see immigrants having a small but positive impact on natives, in some countries, particularly France, we see a negative impact on wages. And I think that the reason for that is um, labor market flexibility, because the, the, the benefits that immigrants have on natives seems to quite closely track the flexibility of those labor markets. So if we think back to that Danish case, where people were brought into new jobs and new jobs were created, the easier it is to hire people and fire people, the easier it seems it to be to make immigrants win-win, so that when they come to the country, they get better off and the natives get better off. Um, there is something called that I call the progressive's dilemma, which is that if you're a progressive, you probably like strong labor market protections. You also probably like immigrants. You're probably quite an internationalist person. Um, I sympathize with both those points of view. But if there is a trade-off between protection for native workers and allowing immigration to be something that's beneficial to native workers and to the immigrants, then the progressive faces a, faces a problem. They either have to be nationalistic, as Bernie Sanders was when he was asked his position on immigration recently, or they have to abandon the domestic um, priorities that they have. Being a free marketeer, I don't have that problem, but I think it's an interesting one for progressives. The fiscal, ar the fiscal argument against immigration, that we just can't afford them, that they're a burden on the welfare state, is common for free marketeers, and this is Milton Friedman's famous, famous quote that's often cited. But in fact, immigrants subsidize the welfare state. Empirically, immigrants, because they tend to be younger and they tend to be uh, less likely to, to draw unemployment benefits, they end up paying in more than they withdraw. Um, so what we have here is a chart of debt projections in the UK, and the different scenarios reflect different levels of immigration over the next 50 years. And what you can see is, the more immigrants we have coming into the country, the less our debt burden becomes, or the less our debt burden is, because these young people are basically paying the pensions of all British retirees. The debt bomb is entirely avoidable. Um, if we are happy to bring in more immigrants. And it's true, we'd have to bring in more, more immigrants every year. We can't just take in a bunch of people for 20 years and then just stop. Uh, but this is one way to make the current welfare state that we have much, much more sustainable. I'd actually like to reform it for other reasons, but um, this, is a, this is one thing that people who are um, interested in avoiding a huge Greek-style collapse should be looking at. Um, and the fiscal effects are pretty, pretty clear. Um, in the UK, migrants represent 13% of all workers, but only 7% of out-of-work claimants. They brought lots of human capital in terms of their education to the UK, um, and they paid in more. I'm not going to talk about that EEA point there, but um, it's, a, it's an interesting one if we have more time. So then the global argument is, how do, Im how do immigration, how, how does immigration from poor countries to rich countries affect poor countries and affect the people themselves? So we, they're very poor, so we should consider their welfare. And if immigration from poor countries is hurting those home countries, that would be a reason to oppose immigration, in my opinion. But what we see is that location matters. The same worker can make much, much less money in their home country if where they're coming from is poor than in the country they go to. So these are um, photographs of garment workers in Bangladesh, and um, the same people doing the same jobs, or, or different people doing the same job in Manchester. This is a soap opera in the UK. Um, and the garment workers in Bangladesh can hope to make about £500 a year doing that job. From doing exactly the same job, they could make £20,000 a year in Manchester. So what's going on? The difference is institutions, things like the rule of law, 
um, free speech, political stability, uh, a re reasonably decent tax and regulatory system that we have in the UK and most Western countries. All of these things are extremely valuable to factories and to investors when they're trying to decide where to, um, where to put their factories, where to put their money. The reason is that the risk of investing in Bangladesh is very high. You have to pay off people, you don't know if the government's going to seize your factory, and so on. And that makes it very, very expensive to operate in these places, whereas it's much cheaper in relative terms to operate in Manchester. Migration allows us to have the best of both worlds. We can have these poor people, we can have, give these people um, the chance of earning kind of Manchester level wages, but we can stretch our institutions over them by allowing them to come here and bringing them here. When we look at the data, that seems to be what happens. Um, the benefits from reducing all barriers or eliminating all barriers to trade globally um, seem to be in the order of about 4% of global GDP. Now that's obviously very good. Um, that 4% would probably mostly accrue to poor countries because rich countries have relatively free trade between them already. So that would be a good thing to do. But the boost from reducing bar barriers or to eliminating barriers to migration is enormous between 67% and 147% of the global GDP. So we're talking about doubling the amount of wealth that we can produce every year just by letting people work anywhere in the world they can get a job. And these numbers are unfeasible because they, they expect a huge number of people to migrate and the, they, they don't factor in the impact that that might have on the countries that they go to in terms of politics, institutions and so on. But what, they, what it does show is the magnitude of what we're talking about. Free trade is great, I love free trade, but free migration could give us much, much, much more extra wealth than free trade could. So the biggest argument against free trade, or free, free movement of migrants, I should say, is the brain drain case. Um, this is that we're taking the kind of cream of the crop from poor countries, and we're depriving those poor countries of those great people. But actually, I suspect that what we have is a brain gain, because most of these people wouldn't be able to become computer programmers or um, engineers or scientists in their home countries. They would end up just working in those garment factories. Those opportunities that they can, they can access here don't exist in their home countries. And not only are they better off in a way that they just never would be able to back in their home countries, they send back lots and lots of money in the form of remittances. So in 2012, $400 billion was sent by migrants from rich countries to poor countries um, through things like Western Union and so on. And that's three times as much money as was sent in development aid at, at, in that year. Uh, this money obviously bypasses governments, so it avoids problems with corruption and so on. Um, and it seems to be an excellent way of reducing poverty. It doesn't lose growth that much, but it could be an excellent way of making the poorest people in these countries better off by allowing people from them to come and work here. Guest worker programs, when done in um, randomized controlled trials, compared with things like uh, microcredit, uh, which is very small loans to small businesses, um, conditional cash transfers, where we just give people money on condition that they, say, invest it in improving their business or something like that. Um, the benefits are enormous. As you can see in this chart, the, um, the, I mean, we're talking about differences um, of more than 10 times in the um, income gain to families that are involved in guest worker programs, in this case in fruit picking in New Zealand, um, compared to getting these loans or getting this, this money. So migration might actually be a very, very good anti-poverty tool, even if it is just guest worker programs. Now everybody knows the arguments about crime to do with immigration. And that, does, that is a problem, actually, mostly because immigrants are young and young people commit crime. Um, we have evidence uh, from the UK from two waves of immigration, one from asylum seekers in the late 1990s and early 2000s, one from European Unions, uh, or, sorry, Eastern Europeans from 2004 on. And in neither case, when they went to different parts of the UK, was there an uptick in violent crime. Um, so there just isn't evidence that there's an increase in violent crime from either of these groups. Uh, but asylum seekers were associated with an increase in property crime. The authors of this report hypothesize that this is because asylum seekers are generally banned from working for at least a year after they come to the country. This is to dissuade people from coming sort of for bogus reasons just to get work. But where there is crime, where there is a spike in crime elsewhere apart from that, it seems to just be because immigrants are younger. It doesn't seem to be because immigrants are more prone to commit crimes uh, for any other reason. I think the biggest argument, though, against immigration is the impact that it has on social cohesion and trust. Um, social cohesion um, is often measured in quite strange ways. We might ask people, do you know your neighbour? Uh, do you lock your front door at night? Do you uh, worry about your house being burgled? Things like that, that are a good proxy for basically how much people feel part of their community, which is very important to most people's sense of well-being. 
there's much less of an impact on social cohesion from immigration into the EU and into the UK than there is in America. In America, there does seem to be a significant negative impact on social cohesion into neighbor in neighborhoods that suddenly get a new influx of immigrants. Um, this is probably because social cohesion is generally just lower in the UK and the EU, possibly because we have more immigrants. Um, we have a more kind of, we already um, have kind of more diverse communities, particularly in urban areas. Um, this is very difficult to quantify. It's very difficult to say how, how expensive this is, but we need to try. Um, I can't do so here. I haven't seen any attempt to do this, to quantify it in dollar terms or in pound terms, but it's something that we need to do, and it's one argument against immigration that I think we can't dismiss. The next argument is similar, that immigrants tend to vote left. Um, I'm not necessarily saying we should try and keep out anybody just because of the way they vote, but if left-wing institutions like heavily redistributive states or heavily regulatory states seem to uh, reduce growth, they might make us poorer overall. And if we, if we allowed millions of immigrants into the UK or tens of millions of immigrants into the US and we didn't assimilate them properly into our native culture, then there might be a problem with them changing the institutions altogether. There might become a problem with, say, ghettos of immigrants where the rule of law isn't as strong as it might be, and that might reduce the overall quality of the institutions that make us so rich. So that's another reason to not be entirely positive about immigration. It's one cost associated with immigration that we should consider. So the question, though, of who benefits and who loses from immigration is the final point. And all of the data that I've talked about talks about uh, median income, uh, talks about people in the middle of society and how immigration affects them. And in general, on average, immigration is very good for people. But there does seem to be evidence in the UK, at least, that, that people in the bottom 10% can lose out from immigration. Their wages can fall. This is also true of international trade. When um, jobs like manufacturing jobs, call center, very low-skilled jobs like that, are exported from the UK to the developing world, the, even though everybody gets richer overall, there can be a small group of society that doesn't get richer because new jobs that are better, better jobs aren't, just aren't created for them. There's evidence in both directions. The Danish case, I think, might um, weigh against this, but it's something we need to consider. On the other hand, the migrants benefit enormously. Remember those garment workers who, are, who go from earning 500 pounds a year to 20,000 pounds a year. That's a 40-fold increase in their welfare. And um, that's something that I don't think that we can dismiss unless we take a very strange position about whose welfare is important. I, I, I just assume that everybody's is important. But perhaps there are better policies for us to consider than limiting immigration outright. I am of the opinion that, yes, these are problems, but none of them is best solved by restricting immigration um, as much as we are now. In every case, uh, for example, when it comes to social cohesion, we can do more work to try and integrate people into the communities that they move in. We can put more social pressure on people to speak the language of the country they move to, rather than stopping them from coming here altogether. But there are things to consider. What I've tried to show here is that there are significant benefits for immigration, both to us, the receiving countries, and especially to the migrants themselves. The questions then we, that we need to consider are how much does the welfare of other people, people from outside our country, matter to us? To me, it matters as much as the welfare of anybody on the street below me. To some people, it matters very little. To some people, it matters not at all. The question is, how important is social cohesion to us? How much would we pay in terms of reduced income in order to preserve aspects of social cohesion that might be reduced with more immigration? How, how risk-averse are we? What are the seen benefits of immigration? I think the, benefit, I think the benefits of immigration are very clear um, when you look at the economics. The costs of immigration are quite difficult to quantify, and that's something we need to put work on. And what policies might we prefer? What kinds of things might we do to try and offset the negative impacts of immigration that don't involve restricting the immigrants altogether and making everybody poorer? I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Um, this is clearly just skimming the surface, but um, what I want you to, to realize is that there are great things about immigration and there are bad things about immigration. I don't think our current policy recognizes either of these things very well. And I think that whatever you end up thinking, you, you, you should agree or you should uh, recognize that the public debate that we have about immigration is grossly misinformed and could do with a lot more evidence and a lot less emotion. Thank you.